for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Paws. And welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. I'm Darren Gibson, your host today. We have a couple of polls to talk about. Harris more popular than Trump among Asian American, Native American, and Pacific Islander registered voters. So that's good news there. We have the vice presidential debate to talk about. And there's a new poll that just came out showing that Tim Walls is uh, pretty popular, more popular than uh, J.D. Vance. So we will talk about that story as well and go over that poll. Mark Robinson, the lieutenant governor and Republican gubernatorial candidate for North Carolina, is in hot water and it is bad. We'll tell you how bad it is for him in just a moment. And we've got so much to talk about here. Uh, West Virginia's governor, uh, they have a business. They are apparently behind on payments to the employee's health insurance fund by a couple million dollars. And that, that's what the union claims, and I believe the union before I believe a lying Republican. So there you go. Plus, we got to talk about the latest in Ottawa County, Michigan, and Ottawa Impact. Before we get started with today's topics, a couple of reminders. You can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash South Paws Radio Show. You can follow us on X at South Paws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at South Paws Radio Show .com. You can follow us on YouTube and Mastodon by doing a search for South Paws Radio. And you can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash South Paws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime at Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Podcast Addict, Podvine, and Pandora by doing a search for South Paws. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, X, Tumblr, YouTube, and Mastodon accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern. And you can listen to us on Great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico. Be sure to listen to us there on your local Pacifica affiliate. And if your local Pacifica affiliate is not carrying us, give them a call and ask them to please pick up South Paws. We would greatly appreciate that. We are recording this show on Thursday, September 26, 2024. We're going to focus a lot on the upcoming election here. Let's get to our first story. This is Josh Boak, Zeke Miller, and Steve Peoples writing for the Associated Press. This is dated September 25th out of Pittsburgh. Derided by Donald Trump as a communist, Kamala Harris is playing up her street cred as a capitalist. Attacked by Harris as a rich kid who got $400 million from his father on a silver platter, Trump is leaning into his raw populism. The two presidential candidates had dueling speeches Wednesday that reflect how they're honing their economic messages for voters in battleground states. Both are trying to counter criticism of them while laying out their best case for a public that still worries about the economy's health. Economy's doing fine. If Donald Trump tells you the economy is doing poorly, he's lying to you, just like he always has. Vice President Harris uh, was set to speak at the Economic Club of Pittsburgh, where she plans to stress a pragmatic philosophy while outlining new policies to boost domestic manufacturing, and that is according to a senior campaign official who sought anonymity to describe the upcoming address. The Democratic nominee's remarks come after she told a swanky audience of donors in New York City on Sunday that she would cut any red tape holding back growth. Donald Trump delivered a speech in Mint Hill, North Carolina, in which he claimed the economy was weak despite inflation easing and the unemployment rate at a healthy 4.2%. Again, the Associated Press refers to Donald Trump as former president. We don't do that on this show. 
Uh, the Republican nominee made his reputation as a businessman, a very poor one at that. Just look at his Truth Social stock over the last few months. But he's recently expressed a willingness to crack down on businesses and has proposed to cap interest rates on credit cards and slap a whopping 200% tariff on tractor maker John Deere if it moves any jobs to Mexico. You know who's going to pay that tariff? It ain't going to be John Deere. It ain't going to be Mexico. It's going to be you, the consumer. Guaranteed. Trump doesn't tell you that. So it's going to be a 200% tax on your John Deere equipment. Oh, my God. It's really easy to figure out, folks. It really is. You just got to stop listening to Donald Trump. It gets easy to listen to what the truth is after that. The candidates are each emphasizing the economy at a time when polls show that it is one of the most important issues for voters as they consider who to support. A recent AP NORC poll found that neither candidate has a decisive edge with the public on the issue. Both are eager to embrace an image as tax cutters and are accusing the other of backing massive tax hikes on the middle class. It's a meaningful shift in messaging as inflation concerns have ebbed somewhat with the Federal Reserve cutting its benchmark interest rates last week. In his speech that includes insinuations that Iran was tied to the two assassination attempts against him, Trump defended tariffs to a group of furniture makers as a way to protect their jobs. Trump said, quote, If I didn't do what I did, this building would now be shuttered. Closed, empty, no jobs. End of quote. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Trump said that some Wall Street geniuses called him about why he only pledged to cut corporate taxes for companies that make their goods in the United States, and he said he told them, quote, I did, end of quote. Uh, I don't know about that. you got to quit believing Trump. He lies. Every time he opens his mouth, a lie tumbles out of it. Trump said the corporate tax rate would drop from 21% to 15% for companies that make their products domestically. He said that his support for tariffs is making him an international target, saying, quote, this is why people in countries want to kill me. They're not happy with me, end of quote. <laughs> so now the countries are trying to kill him. First he blamed it on the Democrats. Now he's blaming it on other countries. The reason he's been the target of an assassination attempt twice. Yeah, both times the as would be assassin was a supporter of Trump at one time or another. So there you go, folks. This is own supporters doing it. Inside job, I'm telling you, fake. It's fake. It's BS. Oh. Billionaire Mark Cuban said business leaders like him are backing Harris because she has taken considered stances that companies can understand even when they have a different perspective. On a Tuesday call with reporters set up by the Harris campaign, Mark Cuban said, quote, I want a president that for business goes into details and has a policy team that understands all the ramifications of what's been proposed, end of quote. The Harris campaign's efforts to show their business support have overlapped with Trump's offering a host of populist ideas. In addition to wanting no taxes on tips, Social Security, or overtime pay, he wants to limit the interest rate on credit cards to 10% and set up low tax zones on federal lands to lure employers. Trump also wants to ditch the cap on the deduction of state and local taxes that he put into the tax code in 2017 while president. He did that himself, folks. Now he's like, oh, I want to reverse that. No, he doesn't. He won't do it. He never does what he says. I've got a replacement for the Affordable Care Act. It'll be out in four weeks, a, month, a year later. Oh, I've got a replacement. It'll be out in four weeks. And it never happened. Now he has concepts of an idea. <laughs> in other words, they don't have squat. And if you're dumb enough to believe Donald Trump, then I don't know what to tell you. If you're that dumb, please tear up your voter registration card and stay home. Both candidates see an opportunity to trash the other's tax ideas. Trump recently dubbed Harris the tax queen. She wants to raise the corporate tax rate to 28% from 21%, as well as tax the unrealized capital gains of people worth more than $100 million. 
She would use the revenue from that and other policies to sustain tax cuts for the middle class that are set to expire after 2025, as well as offer new tax breaks to parents and entrepreneurs. Many of her policies build on ideas initially proposed by President Joe Biden. Trump claims her tax hikes would ultimately trickle down to the middle class. Gee, where have we heard trickle down before? Ronald Reagan. Oh, it'll, it'll trickle down to you. The tax cuts on the rich. It'll trickle down to the lower classes. And it never did. You talk about trickle down when they're peeing on you. That's what it is, folks. That's what it is. Trump told an audience on Monday, quote, she's coming for your money, she's coming for your pensions, and she's coming for your savings, end of quote. No, that's an admission by Trump that he's coming for your pensions and savings and your money. He is, not Harris, Trump is, period, end of story. Harris has shown the two can play that game. She labeled his call for tariffs a national sales tax as it could increase the cost of coffee, clothes, electronics, autos, and almost anything that gets imported or depends on imported parts. Her campaign likes to cite an analysis that originated with Brendan Duke of the Center for American Progress that estimated a 20% universal tariff would, cro- would cost a typical family almost $4,000 a year more than what they're paying now. For taxpayers in the middle income range, that sum would effectively increase their f- total federal taxes by 50%. That is according to calculations based on Treasury Department data. Speaking in Georgia on Tuesday, Trump singled out the word tariff for praise, calling it, quote, one of the most beautiful words I've ever heard, end of quote. Yeah. He said it would raise hundreds of billions in tax revenues and not cause inflation. Well, we know that's not the truth. Most economic analyses said broad tariffs would worsen inflation. The investment bank Goldman Sachs suggested that the tariffs accompanied by a crackdown on immigrants in the United States would hurt growth. Harris has made efforts to elevate the middle class her top priority, often talking about her own background in the middle class to suggest that her ideas emerged out of a personal journey. But at a New York City event on Sunday, she also made a pitch aimed at corporations that want less drama when dealing with government. Harris said, quote, We will create a stable business environment with consistent and transparent rules of the road. We will invest in semiconductors, clean energy, and other industries of the future. And we will cut needless bureaucracy and unnecessary red tape, all of which will create jobs, drive broad-based economic growth, and cement America's leadership throughout the world. End of quote. So there's your contrast between Vice President Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. There's your difference between the two. All right, let's go ahead to our next story here. This is our first polling story. This is Lindley Sanders writing for the Associated Press. This is dated September 25th out of Washington. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, the Republican vice presidential candidate, is less popular among voters than his Democratic rival, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. That is according to a new survey from the Associated Press NORC Center for Public Affairs Research. Both Vance and Walls entered the spotlight this summer as relative political unknowns. As both running mates prepare to address a huge audience in next week's vice presidential debate, Democrats are more positive about Walls and Vice President Kamala Harris than Republicans are about Vance and Donald Trump. Again, they refer to Trump as former president. Again, we don't do that here. The findings of the new survey reinforce the challenge for the Republican presidential ticket as voting begins in more and more states. The poll shows that negative feelings about Vance are considerably more widespread than positive opinions. About half of registered voters have a somewhat or very unfavorable view of Vance, up from about 4 4 in 10 in late July, while around one quarter have a somewhat or very favorable view of him and a similar share don't know enough to say. Walls, by contrast, is better liked. About three in ten voters have a negative view of Walls, while about four in ten have a positive opinion, and about three in ten don't know enough to say. That difference in favorability extends to the candidate's bases. 
About 7 in 10 Democratic voters have a positive opinion of Walls compared to about 6 in 10 Republican voters who have a favorable view of Vance. Democratic candidates tend to receive more support from women while Republicans perform better among men. That gap is clear in Trump and Harris's favorability numbers, but Walls is better liked than Vance among both men and women. About 4 in 10 male and female voters have a positive view of Walls, about 3 in 10 men, and about one quarter of the women have a positive view of Vance. Walls also has a popularity advantage over Vance among voters over the age of 60. Half of voters in this group view Walls somewhat or very favorably, while about 3 in 10 have a similar opinion of Vance. Despite his strength over Vance in some areas, there are also some key Democratic groups where Walls still has work to do. About three-quarters of black adults have a very favorable view of Harris, while roughly half say the same about Walls. She is also viewed more positively by women. About three in ten women don't know enough about Walls to have an opinion. In general, though, neither of the vice presidential candidates outshine Harris or Trump among major demographic groups, and they remain less well-known than the presidential nominees, even among groups that are traditionally part of each party's base. For example, about one quarter of white voters without a college degree don't know enough to say about Vance, and around four in ten voters between the ages of 18 and 29 don't have an opinion on walls. This means their popularity could continue to shift as their national profiles rise. Okay, now about the poll. The poll of 1,771 registered voters was conducted September 12th through 16th of 2024 using a sample drawn from NORC's probability-based Amerispeak panel, which is designed to be representative of the U.S. population. The margin of sampling error for registered voters is plus or minus 3.4 percentage points. So there's the actual numbers behind the story. Speaking of polling, let's get to our next story. This is Terry Tang and Lynn Lee Sanders writing for the Associated Press. This is dated September 24th out of Washington. Vice President Kamala Harris is viewed more favorably by Asian American, Native American, and Pacific Islander registered voters than Donald Trump, according to a new poll. AAPI voters also are more likely to believe that she is the candidate who better represents their background and policy views. The new survey from AAPI data and APIA vote finds that around 6 in 10 AAPI voters have a very or somewhat favorable opinion of Harris, while about one-third have a somewhat or very unfavorable view. In comparison, 3 out of 10 AAPI voters have a positive view of Trump, and about two-thirds view him negatively. So yeah, one-third and two-thirds. There you go. That's an increase in favorability for Harris since October 2023 when an AP NORC AAPI data poll found that about half of AAPI adults had a somewhat or very favorable view of her. Opinions of Trump among this group have remained stable. Harris is both black and South Asian American and has worked to rally AAPI voters in swing states like Georgia where their numbers are growing. But while the poll indicates that AAPI voters are much more likely to see their own cultural identity reflected in her than in Trump, about half of AAPI voters say Harris better represents their background and culture, while only about 1 in 10 say this about Trump. It's not clear how much this is influencing their perspectives on the candidates. Only about 3 in 10 AAPI voters say that Harris's Asian Asian Indian identity is extremely or very important to them, although some AAPI Americans may be more connected to her background than others. About 7 in 10 Asian Indian adults see Harris as the candidate who better represents their background and culture, which is higher than AAPI adults overall. Ping Hackle, a 27-year-old Chinese-American independent in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is planning to vote for Harris, but not because of the Democratic candidate's race or gender. Hackle said, quote, I don't really care she can be anybody, end of quote. Hackle says she worries about the preservation of dem democracy and divisiveness that could lead to political violence. Thus, she feels Trump, quote, is very dangerous to the country. Yep, I agree there. 
In fact, the poll indicates that Harris's gender may be more salient to AAPI voters than her racial background. While the Harris campaign has avoided emphasizing that she could be the first female president, about half of AAPI women voters say that her identity as a woman is extremely or very important to them. AAPI women are also more likely than AAPI men to say their ba own background as Asian or Asian American is at least very important to how they think of themselves, and they're also more likely to say this about their identity as a person of color. And younger AAPI voters between the ages of 18 and 34 are especially likely to care about Harris's identity as a woman. Christine Chen, executive director of APIA Vote, said, quote, We've seen so much organizing from young people as well as AAPI women who are really leading the different ethnic specific affinity groups like the South Asians for Women, South Asians for Harris, Korean Americans for Harris, Chinese Americans for Harris. End of quote. And the survey suggests that AAPI voters may be hearing more from Democratic organizers. About 4 in 10 AAPI voters say they have been contacted by the Democratic Party a great deal or some in the last year, while about 3 in 10 said the same about the Republican Party. Trump and Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance have also recently echoed old stereotypes about Asian Americans and food by amplifying false rumors that Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio are eating pets. And the poll found that the issue of racism is broadly important for this group. About 7 in 10 AAPI voters say they could not ever vote for a candidate who does not share their view on racism or discrimination, making it a bigger deal-breaker issue than the economy. Not all AAPI voters have a negative view of Trump, though. Jihua Ma, a 45-year-old naturalized citizen from China who lives in Boston, leans Republican and voted for Trump in 2020. Ma feels Trump is still the most effective leader. Ma said, quote, I recognize that he's mean and he sometimes posts mean pictures. I'm electing someone to really run this country, not someone to be a friend, a nice person, end of quote. Ma wants someone who will get inflation and the border under control, and he's unsatisfied with Harris's proposals on those issues. Ma said, quote, I don't see her policy has a solid platform, end of quote. He added that he couldn't think of any accomplishments Harris has made as vice president or as a senator from California. And it's still possible that Trump can make inroads with AAPI voters, although the gap in popularity between the candidates leaves a lot of ground to make up. Karthik Ramakrishman, founder and executive director of AAPI Data, said, quote, An issue where the Republican Party could chip away AAPI support is on the economy and on crime. And I think this is where you know Harris has tried to blunt some of those critiques by offering some proposals, end of quote. So there's a look at what uh, Asian Americans and uh, Pacific Islanders believe about Harris and Trump. All right, let's get into our next story here. This is Meg Kennard writing for the Associated Press. This is dated September 23rd. Donald Trump confirmed Monday that he would be the sole featured speaker at this year's Al Smith Charity Dinner in New York, typically a good-humored and bipartisan political event that Vice President Kamala Harris said she is skipping in favor of battleground state campaigning. Trump, the current Republican presidential nominee, confirmed in a Truth Social post on Monday that he would speak at the October 17th dinner, calling it sad but not surprising that Harris had opted not to attend. The gala benefiting Catholic charities traditionally has been used to promote collegiality, with presidential candidates from both parties appearing on the same night and trading barbs. But on Saturday, Harris's campaign said the Democratic nominee would not go to the event, breaking with presidential pr tradition, so she could campaign instead in a battleground state less than three weeks before Election Day. Harris's team wants her to spend as much time as possible in the battleground states that will decide the election, rather than in heavily Democratic New York, a campaign official said, speaking on the condition of anonymity to discuss campaign plans and confirming a decision first reported by CNN. Her team told organizers that she would be willing to attend as president if she's elected, the official said. 
Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who plays a prominent role in the dinner, has been highly critical of Democrats, writing a 2018 Wall Street Journal op-ed that carried the headline, The Democrats Abandoned Catholics. In his Truth Social post, Trump said Harris, quote, certainly hasn't been very nice, end of quote, to Catholics, saying that Catholic voters who support her, quote, should have their head examined, end of quote. Yeah. Yeah. A Harris campaign official said Catholics for Harris Walls is working to register people to vote and get involved in outreach across the country. Trump's post stems in part from 2018 questions that then-Senator Harris posed to a federal judicial nominee about his membership in the Knights of Columbus, a lay Catholic fraternal organization. Harris asked the nominee if he agreed with the anti-abortion views of the group's leader, views that broadly align with the church's stance. The Alfred E. Smith Memorial Foundation dinner is named for the former New York governor, a Democrat and the first Roman Catholic to be nominated for president by a major party. He was handily defeated by Herbert Hoover in 1928. The dinner raises millions of dollars for Catholic charities and has traditionally shown that those vying to lead the nation can get along or pretend to for one night. It's become a tradition for presidential candidates ever since Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy appeared together in 1960. In 1996, the Archdiocese of New York decided not to invite then-President Bill Clinton and his Republican challenger Bob Dole, reportedly because Clinton vetoed a late-term abortion ban. Trump and Joe Biden, who is Catholic, both spoke at the fundraiser in 2020 when it was moved online because of COVID-19. Amid the pandemic and economic woes, there was no joking, and both candidates instead used their speeches to appeal to Catholic voters. Both Trump and Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton attended in 2016. Trump was booed after calling Clinton corrupt and claiming she hated Catholics. So, there you go. I tell you what. Cardinal Timothy Dolan needs to be looking at the corruption and the sex scandals inside the Catholic Church before uh, demonizing or criticizing Democrats. Better clean up your own house first, because there are still priests out there that are diddling with little boys and little girls out there. It's the truth. Or you're hiding them that have in the past. Just, Just tell them the truth, folks. I don't care if it pisses off any Catholics out there. I just, I'm sorry, I just don't believe in religion. I never have and I never will. Religion has been the bane of society ever since the start of time. It has been. The Crusades, the Inquisition, you name it. And I just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just glad I'm atheist. Very glad I'm atheist. Because I don't need a book of fiction to tell me how to treat my fellow man. I can pretty much figure that out on my own. You treat people as you want to be treated. Speaking of, since we're talking about abortion here, I want to get to our story that I talked about last week about my friend who had an abortion several years ago and is now voting for Donald Trump. And the just absolute, it's crazy. I just don't understand why women who have had an abortion are going to go and vote for Trump. I don't get it. I don't understand it. So again, I mentioned it on last week's show and I asked people to write in. I didn't receive any emails uh, like I had hoped for, but I did receive this comment on my personal Facebook page. Uh, King Chuck, Chuck Cook, a longtime supporter of the show. Here's what he commented. Quote, I would show your friend that far side comic that shows a cow grilling hamburger. A woman voting Republican, especially one who had an abortion, is the equivalent. So there you go. It's the equivalent. (laughs) And I've seen that cartoon before, that cartoon from the far side. It's a cow wearing a chef's hat, barbecuing hamburgers. And two other cows point and say, you're sick, Jesse, sick, sick, sick. (laughs) <laughs> oh that's funny yeah that but that's what you get that's what you get when you vote trump it's unreal it's absolutely unreal folks 
All right, let's get into our next story here. Uh, labor battle going on with uh, Boeing and its striking machinists. This is David Koenig writing for the Associated Press. This is dated September 23rd. Boeing said Monday it made its best and final offer to striking machinists that includes bigger raises and larger bonuses, but the workers' union said the proposal isn't good enough and there won't be a ratification vote before Boeing's deadline at the end of the week. Leaders of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers District 751 told members Monday night, quote, Boeing does not get to decide when or if you vote. The company has refused to meet for further discussion. Therefore, we will not be voting, end of quote, on Friday, as Boeing insisted. Boeing said that after two days of talks last week with federal mediators failed to produce an agreement, quote, we presented a best and final offer that made significant improvements and addresses feedback from the union and our employees, end of quote. The new offer is more generous than the one that was overwhelmingly rejected earlier this month. The company said the offer included pay raises of 30% over four years, up from 25% in the first proposal. The union originally demanded 40% over three years. The new offer, and labeling it a final one, demonstrates Boeing's eagerness to end the strike that began September 13th. The company introduced rolling furloughs of non-unionized employees last week to cut costs during the strike. The strikers faced their own financial pressure to return to work. They received their final paychecks last week and will lose company-provided health insurance at the end of the month, according to Boeing. Once again, it's another reason why we need to have single-payer universal health care in this country. You don't lose your health care if you go on strike. It's that simple. Bernie Sanders has it right. We need single-payer universal health care now. The company said its new offers contingent on members of the Machinist Union in the Pacific Northwest ratifying the contract by late Friday night when the strike will be a little over two weeks old. The union, which represents factory workers who assemble some of the company's best-selling planes, waited several hours before pushing back Monday night. The union told members, quote, This proposal does not go far enough to address your concerns, and Boeing has missed the mark with this proposal. End of quote. The group added that it will survey members about the new offer. Boeing's latest offer includes upfront pay raises of 12%, plus three annual raises of 6% each. It would double the size of ratification bonuses to $6,000. It also would keep annual bonuses based on productivity. In the rejected contract, Boeing sought to replace those payouts with new contributions to retirement accounts. Boeing said average annual pay for machinists would rise from $75,608 now to $111,155 at the end of the four-year contract. The new offer would not restore a traditional pension plan that Boeing eliminated about a decade ago. Striking workers cited pay and pensions as reasons why they voted 94.6% against the company's previous offer. Boeing also renewed a promise to build its next new airline plane in the Seattle area if that project starts in the next four years. That was a key provision for union leaders who recommended adoption of the original contract offer but one that seemed less persuasive to rank-and-file members. So once again, union leaders are selling out the rank-and-file. That's what it is, folks. And rank-and-file have had enough. It's the same with the Teamsters. Teamsters, oh, we're not going to endorse anybody. But yet, every single local union in the state of Michigan has endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris. She's getting endorsements from Teamsters in Pennsylvania, in Minnesota, in California, across this country. And that's because rank-and-file workers know what side of the bread has the butter on it. The strike is likely already starting to reduce Boeing's ability to generate cash. The company gets much of its cash when it delivers new planes, but the strike has shut down production of 737s, 777s, and 767s. Work on 787s continues with non-union workers in South Carolina. Of course, because there's scabs down there. A lot of scabs. South Carolina don't believe in the right to unionize because they're a bunch of hillbilly rednecks. They still believe the Confederacy is alive and well. They'd like to have slaves again. You heard North Carolina's lieutenant governor, the one that's running for governor, 
Oh, I'm, I'd have slaves. I'd have slaves if it was me. Black Nazi, my ass. <laughs> we'll talk about Mark Robinson in actually just a little bit here. On Friday, Boeing began requiring thousands of managers and non-union employees to take one week off without pay every four weeks under the temporary rolling furloughs. It also has announced a hiring freeze, reduced business travel, and decreased spending on suppliers. The money-saving measures are expected to last as long as the strike continues, which hopefully will continue until the machinists get 40% and get their pensions back. Hey, now's the time to fight. It's time to fight right now for your rights, to fight for good union wages, good pensions, good insurance, better working conditions. Now's the time to fight. It's time to do it now. There's no better time than now. All right, I want to get to our next story here. This is the Associated Press writing out of Wilkesboro, North Carolina. This is dated September 23rd. Listen to this, folks. This crazy stuff has come out about North Carolina Republican gubernatorial candidate Mark Robinson. Listen to this. Robinson vowed Monday to rebuild his campaign staff after several top aides quit and a key Republican group backed away from his race following a CNN report alleging he made explicit racial and sexual posts years ago on a pornography website's message board. Yep. And apparently he likes trans porn, transgender porn. Yeah. Robinson, these, and, and this is a guy that's anti-LGBTQ and he likes transgender porn. Typical Republican, atypical Republican. Robinson, the sitting lieutenant governor, revealed Sunday that his campaign senior advisor, campaign manager, and two other top staffers had stepped down. The senior advisor said separately that four other top aides had also quit. And the Republican Governors Association anticipated to keep running ads to boost Robinson's bid into the fall and opposed Democratic rival Josh Stein, will no longer support Robinson, Association Chair and Tennessee Governor Bill Lee told reporters Monday. Recent polls have shown Stein, the current Attorney General, ahead of Robinson. Stein has also outspent Robinson on the airwaves. Association spokesperson Courtney Alexander sent a prepared statement, quote, Our current media buy in North Carolina expires tomorrow and no further placements have been made. RGA remains committed to electing Republican governors all across the country, end of quote. So the Republican Governors Association is ending all television and radio ads for Mark Robinson in the state of North Carolina. This has a great effect because Robinson's going to wither away, number one, because Stein's going to have all the advertising and Robinson's going to have nothing. But the other thing is, this also hurts Donald Trump. Because that's advertising dollars for Trump that's not being spent in the state. <laughs> I love it. North Carolina could turn blue. That would be fantastic. Lee had been set to travel to North Carolina this week for a scheduled fundraiser for Robinson, but the event was canceled. Lee said Monday that the decision was made before CNN's report ran. Oh, really? I don't know about that. Yeah. I got I don't believe that. This this happened afterwards. It wasn't before. That don't don't let them BS you. <laughs> Robinson, who would be North Carolina's first black governor if elected, has denied writing the messages from more than a decade ago, well before he became active in politics, calling them, quote, salacious tabloid lies, end of quote. Really? <laughs> Fellow Republican leaders are suggesting Robinson, with a long history of inflammatory comments, must make a credible defense or his gubernatorial bid is washed up. <laughs> That's great. Speaking after a campaign event Monday morning in the northwestern North Carolina mountains, Robinson said his campaign is, quote, getting offers from all over, end of quote, to help work for it. 
Real? Oh my! You gotta be joking. Robinson had this to say at a bakery in Wilkesboro, about 80 miles north of Charlotte. "Quote: We're right in the process right now of forming a team that we know can still lead us to victory. So we have full confidence in our ability to keep going." End of quote. Eddie, the only way you're going is down, buddy. Down. And here's why. The CNN report last week unearthed post. It said Robinson left on a porn site message boards in which he referred to himself as a black Nazi, said he enjoyed transgender pornography, said in 2012 he preferred Hitler to then-President Barack Obama, and slammed the late Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. as, quote, worse than a maggot, end of quote. <laughs> Wow, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr., worse than a maggot, really. No, you're looking at yourself in the mirror and saying that you're worse than a maggot there, Mark. Robinson also finds himself separated from Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump, who endorsed Robinson for governor before the March primary and has given him the stage to speak at his in-state rallies. Robinson was not involved in Saturday's Trump rally in Wilmington, and Trump didn't even mention him. Trump has scheduled another North Carolina event for Wednesday in suburban Charlotte. At a campaign event Monday in Charlotte, Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, described the comments as, quote, pretty gross, end of quote, but said that it's up to North Carolina voters to decide what they think of the comments and whether they believe Robinson's defense. In a response to a question from a WBTV reporter, Vance said, quote, the people of North Carolina are going to make that decision. I've seen some of the statements. I haven't seen them all. Some of them are pretty gross, to put it mildly. End of quote. Vance then added this, quote, Mark Robinson said that those statements are false, that he didn't actually speak them. So I think it's up to Mark Robinson to make his case to the people of North Carolina that those weren't his statements, and I'm going to let him make that case. End of quote. In other words, they're going to cut Mark Robinson loose from the party and let him twist in the wind. That's what it is, folks. Trump doesn't want any of this to come back on him and soil his dirty little problems of his own. So, nope, we're going to let Mark Robinson just twist. Yeah. Talking to reporters in Wilkesboro, Robinson said his campaign is talking about taking CNN, quote, to task for what they have done to us. You better understand I am coming after CNN full throttle, end of quote. CNN provided no comment Monday. Hey, I got news for you. Truth is the best defense against libel and slander, period, end of story. Last week, CNN said it had matched details of an account on the pornographic website forum to other online accounts held by Robinson by comparing usernames, a known email address, and his full name. CNN reported the details discussed by the account holder matched Robinson's age, length of marriage, and other biographical information. In a speech to supporters at Vernon's Cake Carousel, Robinson tried to focus on campaign issues like the economy, emphasizing public safety, public education, health care, infrastructure, and housing. He referred briefly to his working class history, saying he knows what it's like to lose a job because the work is being moved to Mexico. Robinson was elected lieutenant governor in his first bid for public office in 2020. He tells a life story that includes childhood poverty, personal bankruptcy, and religious renewal. Considered a rising star in the party, he has been well known for his fiery speeches and evocative rhetoric. Trump had previously called Robinson, quote, Martin Luther King on steroids, end of quote, for his speaking ability. <laughs> yeah, he's he, Mark Robinson's on something. I don't know what. I don't think he's on the juice. He's just on the food because he's a big man. I mean very big. I'm a big man and... I've lost quite a bit of it, thankfully. Stein and his allies have blitzed TV and the Internet with commercials and footage of Robinson making incendiary comments. In a 2021 speech in a church, Robinson used the word filth when discussing gay and transgender people. On a Facebook post in 2019, Robinson said abortion in America is about, quote, killing the child because you weren't responsible enough to keep your skirt down or your pants up and not get pregnant by your own choice because you felt like getting your groove thing on, end of quote. 
Jesus Christ. Shake your groove thing. Shake your groove thing. Oh, Pe- Sorry, uh, all apologies to Peaches and Herb. Very much so. Get your groove thing on. Oh, brother. All right, we got another story here. This is another uh, Republican gone bad. Uh, This is the Associated Press. This is out of Charleston, West Virginia, dated September 24th. A West Virginia state lawmaker who was arrested last month is facing new charges after police say they suspect he was driving under the influence. Police pulled 56-year-old Republican Senator Mike Maroney over on Monday for several alleged traffic offenses. That is according to a published report by the Wheeling News Register. Following a roadside investigation, Maroney was arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence. That is according to McMechan Police Chief Robert Schilling. Maroney was cooperative with police and was taken to jail pending arraignment, Schilling said. He is charged with three misdemeanors, control of a vehicle under the influence, no registration, and expired registration. Maroney, who has served in the state Senate since 2016, did not immediately respond to an email seeking comment Tuesday. Maroney is only a few months left to serve in his second four-year term as a state senator. He ran for re-election but was defeated in the May primary by challenger Chris Rose, a utility company electrician and former coal miner. Maroney's loss came after he publicly opposed a bill pushed by the Republican caucus that would have loosened vaccination requirements for some non-traditional public school students. He also spoke against a total ban on medical interventions such as puberty blockers and hormone therapy for transgender adolescents. Oh, so that's why the Republicans have bailed on him. They probably sent him up for this too. Who knows? Or... I don't know. I guess if I was a Republican, I guess I'd be drinking too. In August, Maroney was. St- <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that was that was cruel even for me, and I'm pretty cruel to Republicans. <laughs> In August, Maroney was stripped of his position as chair of the state Senate Health and Human Resources Committee after being charged with indecent exposure and disorderly conduct. Wow, he's really gone off the deep end, allegedly. Maroney was arrested on the two misdemeanor charges after an August 4th episode at Gumby Cigarette and Beer World in Glendale. (laughs) Gumby Cigarette and Beer World. Oh, my God. Oh, Oh, what's that place that Jim Gurner and I used to go to to get uh, Jim's booze? Uh, it was the home of 999 wine buddies. That's right. Buddies liquor home of 999 wine, <laughs> which Jim talked about on the show. So, but Hey, that's a callback. It's a callback. Marshall County prosecuting attorney, Joe Canestraro said in August that employees in monitoring surveillance video say they saw Maroney committing an act of sexual gratification around 1 p.m. in the video lottery room and called police. Maroney was the only person in the room at the time, according to Canestraro. <laughs> Maroney didn't respond to a request for comment after his August arrest. <laughs> wow. He's got a lot of problems there. I, I guess that's what happens when you're stripped of your leadership by your own party. Speaking of Republicans in West Virginia, I have this story. This is Leah Willingham writing for the Associated Press. This is dated August 23rd out of Charleston, West Virginia. West Virginia Governor Jim Justice's family is millions of dollars behind on payments to Employees Health Insurance Fund at their financially beleaguered hotel, putting workers' coverage at risk despite the U.S. Senate candidates' claims otherwise. That is according to a union official on Friday. Peter Bostick, chairperson of the Council of Labor Unions at the Greenbrier, the historic resort owned by Justice's family, said, quote, the delinquencies are factual, tangible, and documented, end of quote. Justice on Thursday dismissed concerns about at least $2.4 million in delinquent payments to insurance provider during a briefing with the press, saying payments had been made on a regular basis and that there was no way employees would lose coverage. But on Friday, Bostic said the situation is in no way resolved. 
In a statement, he said, quote, We continue to demand that the Greenbrier's delinquent contractual obligations be met and remain hopeful that an agreement will be reached between the NANHF and the Greenbrier to continue benefits into the future, end of quote. Justice's remarks came the same day the Republicans' family announced it had reached an agreement with a credit collection company to prevent the Greenbrier Hotel, which has hosted presidents, royalty, and congressional retreats, from being foreclosed on due to unpaid debts. The Greenbrier was scheduled to go to the auction block August 27th after Beltway Capital declared a long-standing Justice Hotel loan to be in default after purchasing it in July from J.P. Morgan Chase. Bostick said on Friday that in light of the auction being canceled, the Amalgamated National Health Fund had agreed to continue offering union employees at the Greenbrier Health Insurance until the end of the month while they worked to come to an agreement with the justices. Earlier this week, as the auction date approached, about 400 employees at the Greenbrier Hotel received notice from an attorney for the health care provider, Amalgamated National Health Fund, saying they would lose on the day of the auction unless the Justice family paid $2.4 million in missing contributions. The Justice family hasn't contributed to Employees Health Fund in four months, and that an additional $1.2 million in contributions will soon be due, according to the letter the board received from Ronald Richmond, an attorney with Schulte, Roth, and Zabel, LLP, the firm representing the fund. The letter also said some contributions were taken out of employees' paychecks but never transferred to the fund concerning union officials. Justice told reporters at a news briefing on Thursday that, quote, insurance payments were made and were being made on a regular basis. There is no way that the great union employees at the Greenbrier are going to go without insurance. There is no possible way. End of quote. I don't know. It's starting to look like they're going to. Justice began serving the first of his two terms as governor in 2017 after buying the Greenbrier out of bankruptcy in 2009. The 710 room hotel held a PGA Tour golf tournament from 2010 until 2019 and has welcomed NFL teams for training camp and practices. A once secret 112,000 square foot underground bunker built for Congress at the Greenbrier in case of nuclear attack during the Cold War now hosts tours. The auction, which had been set to occur at a courthouse in the small city of Lewisburg, involved 60 and a half acres, including the hotel and parking lot. The Republican said that when he purchased the Greenbrier, employee benefits had been stripped to the bone and he restored them. He said if the hotel had been foreclosed on, quote, there would have been carnage and devastation like you can't imagine to the great people of the Greenbrier, end of quote, referring to jobs that could have been lost. He added, quote, what if we absolutely just threw up our hands? What would have happened to those employees? I mean, it's great to have health insurance, but if you don't have a job, it would be pretty doggone tough, wouldn't it? End of quote. Justice is running for U.S. Senate against Democrat Glenn Elliott, a former mayor of Wheeling. Justice, who owns dozens of companies and had a net worth of an estimated $513 million by Forbes magazine in 2021, has been accused in court cases of being late in paying millions for family business debts and fines for unsafe working conditions at his coal mines. So he owns coal mines, huh? That's where he got his money. Wow. Unbelievable. All right, let's get to our final story here. We have to talk about Ottawa County, Michigan. This is Sarah Leach writing at her Substack uh, forum. This is dated September 12th. So this is an older story, but it is prominent as of late. Another lawsuit is concluded in Ottawa County to the tune of $225,000. On September 10th, the county finalized a settlement agreement with Ryan Kimball, who sued the county late last year for alleged age discrimination by former administrator John Gibbs. Kimball, who was then 49 at the time, was a finalist for an executive aide position in the summer of 2023. In the lawsuit filed October 24th in Ottawa County's 20th Circuit Court, He claimed Gibbs committed age discrimination when he hired a younger candidate with fewer qualifications than the county required. Kimball's attorneys, Robert Howard and Bradley Glazier, argued that Gibbs, and therefore the county, 
violated Michigan's Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, which prohibits employers from treating an applicant or employee less favorably because of his or her age. There are specific legal protections afforded to individuals over the age of 40. The law prohibits discrimination in any aspect of employment, including hiring and firing. Howard said on Thursday, quote, we're happy this was resolved. This unfortunate the litigation was necessary to enforce Mr. Kimball's right to not be discriminated against due to his age, but our client is satisfied with the result, end of quote. He said the $225,000 settlement was the result of a full day of mediation where the parties reached an agreement that would be recommended to the county's insurance authority, which approved the settlement August 19th in closed session. The lawsuit was the fourth of five lawsuits filed against the board since the current Ottawa Impact majority on the County Board of Commissioners were sworn in on January 3rd, 2023. Current board chair Joe Moss founded the far-right fundamentalist group in 2021 after he took issue with pre-K through 6 school mask mandates during the COVID-19 pandemic. He launched the political action committee under the premise of defending parental rights and to thwart tyranny within the state and federal government. The freshman commissioner's first official meeting included several items added last minute to the agenda by the OI commissioners in what seemed to be pre-orchestrated actions, including firing the county administrator and hiring Gibbs, firing corporation counsel, and hiring conservative law firm Kalman Legal Group, demoting the health officer, as well as dismantling the county's diversity, equity, and inclusion department. As the year unfolded, Gibbs received narrow approval from the commission to expand a former executive assistant position to an executive aide, which then resulted in Epperson's hire. When seeking approval, Gibbs said after two months out of the job, quote, it was like drinking through a fire hose, end of quote. Howard and Glazier said Gibbs violated the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act by saying he wanted Epperson for the job because he was young and could be bossed around. Testimony underscoring the claims was made public in October as the OI majority on the board attempted to fire Administrative Health Officer Adeline Hambly during a termination hearing. Hambly's attorney, Sarah Riley Howard, elicited testimony during the proceedings from former County Deputy Administrator Patrick Waterman, as well as former Human Resources Director Marcy Verbeek about how Gibbs and the county approached the hiring process for the executive aide. Waterman, who resigned in July, citing a strained working relationship with Gibbs and a lack of effective leadership by the new Board of Commissioners, said he was present during the hiring process for the aid position and had concerns about Epperson over certain behaviors he showed during his interviews. Waterman testified, quote, to my recollection, Mr. Epperson raised support for Ottawa Impact in his interviews, end of quote. He also confirmed Verbeek's testimony that Epperson refused to shake the hands of the women on the interviewing committee, herself and finance director Karen Karasinski. Waterman replied, quote, that was one issue. There was another issue about ethics. He said, ethics depend on who you are working for. I thought that was a concerning answer, end of quote. Well, I just looked up at the clock and I see that our time is running out, so we'll cut off the story right here. We'll talk more about Ottawa Impact on our next show. The Ottawa Impact Board has cut funding for the health department again, this time a $900,000 federal grant awarded to the Ottawa County Health Department. They're not going to see any of that money. Plus, we'll talk about the vice presidential debate between Tim Walls and J.D. Vance. We'll have more about that on next week's show. That's it for this week. I'm Darren Gibson. Please support independent media, the First Amendment, and a woman's right to choose. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.